According to a new unpublished study, one of the brightest stars you can see in the night sky is likely to explode within our lifetime. The star in question is a red giant called Betelgeuse. It's located in the left shoulder of the constellation of Orion. The star might have no more than 300 years worth of fuel left in its core. Once it burns through these last reserves, the core will collapse, forming a black hole. As for the star's outer layers, they are likely to be blasted out into space at a mind-boggling 25,000 miles per second. This is what astronomers call a supernova. If Betelgeuse goes supernova, it will be a spectacular sight to watch from Earth. The star is comparatively not far from our planets, just 650 light years away. So those layers of ejected gas and dust will shine as bright as the full moon. It will also last for several weeks. Interestingly, most astronomers don't believe Betelgeuse is ready to go kaboom yet. Then, what makes the authors of the new paper think otherwise? Well, this star is definitely a red giant that has burned through its primary fuel, hydrogen. At the moment, it's most likely fusing helium remaining in its core into some heavier elements. The point at which a star runs out of its hydrogen is unmissable. When a star is short on hydrogen, it needs to put extra energy into igniting the helium created during the process of hydrogen fusion. These additional efforts make such a star expand dozens of times beyond its original size. It also becomes redder and cooler in the process. Astronomers know that Betelgeuse is very, very large. If you placed it at the center of our solar system, its outer atmosphere would reach so far that it would swallow Jupiter. But it's hard to measure the exact diameter of the star. All because Betelgeuse is not your regular smooth ball of plasma. Instead, it's a lumpy chunk of boiling gas bubbles hiding behind dust clouds. This is the main reason why mm. measuring the size of the mm. star isn't easy. But to determine the star's remaining lifetime, we must know its diameter. And a team of scientists from Japan suggests that Betelgeuse is larger than most astronomers think. The star is known to pulsate. It expands and shrinks, dims and brightens again and again at regular intervals. Researchers link these changes to the periodical expansion of the star's outer region. There are other oddities in the behavior of the star. They appear on a regular basis, too. Astronomers see the connection between these quirks and turbulent processes taking place inside the star, which seems ready to go out. The research team behind the new study believes that Betelgeuse's main pulsation mode is represented by the 2,200-day cycle and the 420-day brightness variation might be the star's secondary quirk. For this scenario to work, Betelgeuse needs to be up to one-third wider. And to be as wide as necessary for this model, the star has to be in a later stage of its life, done with burning helium and, instead, running on carbon received from previous fusion of helium atoms. Whether a red giant is burning helium or carbon makes a great difference in terms of how much time it has left. If it's still in its helium burning phase, the red giant can live for tens of thousands of years. But if it's already in the carbon burning stage, the end is near and might come within a few thousand years. In the case of Betelgeuse, we can't determine exactly how much carbon the star still has. But carbon exhaustion might happen as soon as in 300 years. After that, fusions of heavier elements might take a few dozens of years. When it's over, the core will collapse and a supernova explosion will occur. Betelgeuse, a red supergiant. This ball of boiling plasma is one of the largest stars in our galaxy and one of the brightest. It's about 500 times larger than the sun. But Betelgeuse is pulsating, getting bigger and smaller. At its peak, it becomes 800 times its average size. If this star were a bucket, it would fit about 300 million suns even though its weight is only 17 times greater. And here, about 500 light years away, is Earth. We launch our faster-than-light spaceship and set off on our journey to Betelgeuse. A few seconds, and we've already traveled 240,000 miles, and now are close to the moon. That's nine and a half trips around the Earth. A traditional rocket-powered spacecraft would take three days to get here. 
we're near Mars now. The flight to the Red Planet usually takes about seven months. Several rovers are now at work here, as well as the first ever flying drone, Ingenuity. The surface of Mars is three times smaller than that of Earth. The planet is also ten times lighter. People hope to build a human colony here soon. Right beyond Mars, we have to wiggle and constantly dodge space rocks. This is the asteroid belt. It contains debris and space objects of different sizes and shapes. The biggest of them is Ceres. Its surface is slightly larger than the area of Argentina, and its weight is about 1% of the moon's. The total weight of the entire asteroid belt is 25 times less than the moon's. Next, we pass gas giants Jupiter and Saturn. These are the largest planets in the solar system. They're also the heaviest, even though they don't have a solid surface. Then, we travel by Uranus and Neptune. They're called ice giants. And at the very edge of the solar system, we see Pluto. It was once considered a full-fledged planet, but now it's not even on the list. After that, we're 4.3 billion miles away from our home. It took the New Horizons space probe about nine years to get here. Hold on to your seat, we're speeding up. We're passing through the Kuiper Belt. There are lots of asteroids and blocks of ice here. These are some of the oldest building materials in our solar system. Billions of years ago, our whole world looked like a cloud of these asteroids. We're traveling further through dark space and reach the edge of the solar system, the heliosphere. All this time, we've been moving with the solar wind. But now, it starts to slow down, collides with the interstellar wind, and heats up. This is called the termination shock. The Voyager 1 space probe got to this point in December 2004. We're moving to the region where the heliosphere ends and interstellar space begins. This is the heliopause. In 2012, Voyager crossed this boundary and became the first ever human-made object in interstellar space. But the message from Voyager reporting this event came to Earth almost a year later because of the huge distance. It took 35 years for Voyager 1 to travel all this way. And here it is. The probe is as long as a car and weighs like two motorcycles. You can see a gold plate on its hull. It's a message from people to potential civilizations out there. It has pictures of Earth's landscapes, recordings of human speech, and our DNA. As of 2021, Voyager has been operational for almost 43 years. The probe has traveled 14 billion miles. That's like 152 Earth to the Sun distances. And it's still making its way through space at 38,000 miles per hour. Now, we're approaching the nearest star to our solar system. It's Proxima Centauri. We're so far from home that even light needs more than four years to travel this distance. If we used a traditional rocket, the trip would take us 73,000 years. The reason we wanted to get here was because of an Earth-like planet called Proxima Centauri b. It's 10% larger than Earth and slightly heavier. It lies in the habitable zone of its host star. It means that water might exist on the planet in its liquid state, and there can be life that forms here. But the star itself occasionally produces flares. Recently, its brightness increased almost 1,000 times. During that time, it emitted so much radiation that even if there were some forms of life on the planet, they probably ceased to exist. We're now more than eight light years away from Earth. The brightest star in our night sky is Sirius. Seriously. It's so bright that you can see it even during the day. But in reality, there are actually two stars, Sirius A and B. They orbit around a common center of gravity, and these stars are moving toward our solar system at almost five miles per second. That's the same as the maximum speed of a top-of-the-line supercar on Earth. Foot down, and we've arrived at a potentially habitable planet 39 light years away from Earth. This is Trappist 1D. Its host star is a white dwarf. It's a cold star, 10 times smaller and lighter than the Sun. There are seven planets around it, but Trappist 1D is the most similar to Earth. It's only 30% smaller and three times lighter, but it has a rocky surface and the temperature here is 48 degrees Fahrenheit. You'd feel comfortable here wearing a light jacket. There might be an atmosphere, mountains, seas, and oceans here, which means this planet might be suitable for a human colony. But it would take about 677,000 years to get here using traditional rockets. And here's our main goal, 
Betelgeuse. It'd take nearly 8.7 million years to travel here from Earth in a current day spacecraft. This star is so big that our ship looks like a grain of sand on a giant beach. We have to jump back in time to find out what happened to this star. First, there was a beautiful nebula. It's a cloud of multicolored space dust and debris. Then, it began to shrink under its own weight. In the core of the nebula, a nuclear reaction began. Boom! And the star was born. At first, Betelgeuse was very massive and hot, but it didn't expand and remained stable. Let's look into its heart. The nuclear reactions in the star's core create a lot of heat and energy. This energy produces the force that pushes on the walls of the star from the inside and causes it to expand. But at the same time, the star is very heavy. That's why gravity pushes on it from the outside. If these two forces are balanced, the star remains stable. But over time, the star runs out of its fuel, helium and hydrogen. That's when heavier elements in the core join the nuclear reaction. When they burn, they release more energy and heat than gravity can hold, and the star starts expanding. That's what's happening to Betelgeuse right now. It's already so big that if you put it in the center of our solar system, its edge would touch the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Betelgeuse will continue to expand until it exhausts its fuel completely. Then the gravity will win. The star will shrink in size, and then an enormous boom will happen. A supernova explosion will be so blinding that Betelgeuse will shine brighter than the moon in the night sky. Luckily, Earth is too far away for this explosion to cause any harm to people. A strong stream of matter that will be ejected from the explosion site won't reach the solar system until 6 million years later. Even so, the solar wind will stop this flow, so we'll be safe. Betelgeuse is likely to explode at any time in the next 10,000 years. But some scientists say it won't happen in the next 100 millennia. Back to the moment before the explosion of Betelgeuse, there can be another, more interesting scenario. Gravity might compress the massive core of the star with such force that a black hole will appear in its place. Black holes are the heaviest objects in the universe. They have incredible gravitational force. Even light can't escape their gravitational trap. The Betelgeuse black hole will begin feeding on cosmic dust and whatever is left of the star. All this debris and light from other stars will get frozen near the event horizon of the growing black hole. For the first time in history, we'll be able to watch the birth of this mysterious object. But in reality, Betelgeuse is too light to become a black hole. Most likely, after the explosion, it'll turn into a white dwarf that will gradually fade until it becomes invisible. Now, it's been a long time since there was a supernova in the Milky Way. Over 400 years, to be precise. So hey, we're long overdue. So here are the most likely stars to go boom, if they haven't already. At the top of the list must be the Southern Hemisphere's star, Eta Carini. Greek letters before the name of the constellation indicate the rank of the star's brightness in that constellation. Sir Edmund Halley, in 1677, recorded Eta Carini as the seventh brightest star in the constellation Carina, Eta being the seventh letter in the Greek alphabet. It might not have looked very bright to Sir Edmund and his contemporaries in the 17th century, but modern studies of Eta Carina estimate it's 5 million times more luminous than our Sun. Luminous is a technical word astronomers use. It doesn't just mean brightness. Luminosity refers to the total energy released at all frequencies. Eta Carina releases 5 million times more energy than the Sun. Truly one of the whoppers of the Milky Way. Eta Carina is 100 times more massive and 240 times larger than our yellow-white dwarf sun, Sol. Obviously, since it appears dim, Eta Carini is pretty far away, about 7,500 light-years away. Yet even at this distance, if this star goes hypernova, it can still impact Earth's ozone layer, disrupt satellite communications, and harm astronauts. 159 years after Halley's observation, Eta Carini experienced a nova-like explosion. It increased from a relatively dim star to become the second brightest star visible from Earth, but only for a period of 27 years. From 1836 until 1863, 
Eta Carinae was the second brightest visible star after Sirius, the dog star. And Sirius is only about 8 light years away. Since 1863, aside from a couple of flare ups, Eta Carinae has dimmed back down to its original brightness at magnitude 4.5. Now astronomers owe us a small apology, which we don't expect to get anytime soon, for star magnitude nomenclature. The brighter a star is, or planet, or moon, the lower its magnitude. Thus, stars brighter than first magnitude are either zero magnitude or negative magnitude. The full moon, for example, is magnitude negative 13. A magnitude positive 4.5 star, like Eta Carinae, is quite dim as seen from Earth but it's clearly visible in a night sky without light pollution or clouds if you live anywhere south of the latitude of Cairo, Egypt. 30 degrees north latitude is the farthest north you can see this star. Now, listen up. Eta Carinae is currently up to something. It's been brightening again and is now brighter than at any time since 1864. It's a complex situation. Eta Carinae is really two stars. Eta Carinae A and Eta Carinae, hmm, what's your guess? Oh, B. There's a third star nearby that's also interacting with the double star's dynamics. Now, without looking, I'm guessing it's named Eta Carinae C. Good guess. Blown out into two incredibly massive globes of gas that are expanding at 20 million miles per hour, Eta Carinae is, without a doubt, one of the strangest looking stars you'll ever see. Remember, it's located at a great distance of 7,500 light years away from us. And if anything had happened to Eta Carinae in the last 7,500 years, like going hypernova, we wouldn't be able to see it. Because none of Eta Carinae's electromagnetic radiation would have gotten here yet. Astronomers are keeping a close watch on Eta Carinae because it can go hypernova at any time. Or maybe it already did 5,000 years ago. In which case, we'd only have to wait another 2,500 years to see it. Yeah, like I'll put it in my planner. Now, from a list of over 30 likely candidate stars that might go supernova, Rho Cassiopeiae is many astronomers' choice. Another Greek letter, Rho, is the 17th letter in the Greek alphabet. It means that Rho Cassiopeiae is the star with the 17th brightest apparent magnitude in the constellation Cassiopeia. Yet Rho Cass, a nickname, is only one of seven known yellow hypergiant stars in the Milky Way. It's another whopper. To be seen at magnitude 4.5 from a distance of about 10,000 light years away, Rho Cass must be a very large star, a hypergiant. Placed where the Sun is, Rho Cass would encompass the orbit of Mars. But it's still yellow. It's not a red giant star. Red indicates a cooler surface temperature. Rho Cass, as huge as it is, is still as hot on its surface as our Sun, or even a little hotter. That can only mean two things. Deep inside its core, Rho Cass is fusing atoms much heavier than hydrogen or helium. Plus, Rho Cass is producing much more energy than a red giant star. In the year 2000, Rho Cass erupted massively. It brightened by two orders of magnitude as it ejected 10,000 times the mass of Earth into space at four times the speed of sound. Astronomers detected the signature of titanium oxide in this eruption. This means that Rho Cass is much closer to going supernova, or in this particular case, hypernova, than astronomers used to assume. Iron is just a few steps above titanium in the periodic table, and when iron forms, fusion stops and a star collapses. Rho Cass is really close, or more correctly, was really close. Because the eruption we saw in the year 2000 really happened 10,000 years before, many astronomers think Rho Cass has already gone hypernova, formed a black hole, and doesn't even exist anymore. Meanwhile, Betelgeuse caught everyone's attention not so long ago. The star, not the movie. It dimmed dramatically, appearing only 37% as bright as it usually is. Is it getting ready to go supernova? Betelgeuse is by far the brightest star in the whole sky, in infrared light. This is an important fact because it relates to Betelgeuse's status as a supernova candidate, as we shall soon see. Betelgeuse is also named Alpha Orionis, another Greek letter designation. So we should conclude that Betelgeuse is the brightest star in Orion, right? Wrong. It's the second brightest star in its constellation. Rigel, or Beta Orionis, is the brightest one in that region. Yeah, figure that one out. 
It may be because Betelgeuse is classified as a semi-regular variable star, which sounds kind of redundant to me. Its approximately 400-day cycle of pulsation changes its brightness by about one full magnitude, going from much brighter than a first magnitude star to closer to a second magnitude star. But never was Betelgeuse observed to dim so rapidly or so drastically as it did recently. So what's going on with it? Well, from late 2019 to mid-2020, Betelgeuse went through a period of substantial dimming during a mass ejection event. The world astronomy community jumped on the situation, and in the course of their investigations, they came up with some surprising new factual data on Betelgeuse. First, Betelgeuse is not as far away as we once thought. The new, more accurate distance for Betelgeuse is 548 light years. That's 25% closer than previously measured. The second new fact, Betelgeuse's diameter has been reduced by the same percentage. The star is now known to be 25% smaller than previously believed. The cause of Betelgeuse's dramatic dimming was also determined. The giant star ejected a cloud of gas that contained magnesium. The cloud blocked a large portion of the light coming from Betelgeuse and made it appear visually much dimmer than it really was. Magnesium is not halfway to iron on the periodic table, which means Betelgeuse is not as far along on the path to a supernova as was suspected previously. When iron starts forming in the star, it means that this star is close to shutting down its fusion reactions. The next step is implosion. We aren't quite there yet with Betelgeuse. This star emits most of its energy as infrared light, and it also indicates that its core is most probably still burning helium, and not something that would greatly increase the amount of heat, like carbon for instance. Betelgeuse will still go supernova, but not for another 100,000 years. So, you can cross it off your supernova list for the time being. And as for how to correctly pronounce Betelgeuse, you can say it any way you like. There are as many different pronunciations out there as there are people who think they know how to pronounce it correctly. Now, Supernova 1987A caught astronomers off guard when it lit up the large Magellanic Cloud 100,000-plus light-years away from the Milky Way. That's when attention was turned to a similar star much closer to Earth, Rigel, in the constellation of Orion. Could Rigel surprise us and suddenly go supernova? There's something called the supernova problem that you should, you know, probably know about because it may relate to Rigel going supernova or not. It seems that stars over 17 solar masses don't always go supernova. Recently, a red giant star simply vanished. Once again, it didn't go supernova, it disappeared. This had often been happening in computer simulations of supernova, and now it finally occurred in real life. Rigel's mass is 21 solar masses. In other words, it's 21 times more massive than our Sun. So, will Rigel go supernova or simply vanish into a black hole that it'll create in its core? Astronomers and physicists continue their work of learning more about the dynamics of massive stars, scouring the sky for the next supernova in the Milky Way. Meanwhile, we can rest confident that we on Earth are in no danger from the harmful effects of nearby supernova explosions. We live in a nice, quiet, peaceful, stellar neighborhood. Except for those Martians next door. A powerful burst of gamma radiation lasted a mere half second, but it released an enormous amount of energy. It was more than our sun would produce in 10 billion years. This brief flash lit up the whole sky. Afterward, a much softer and more long-lasting glow replaced it. Astronomers examined the phenomenon with X-ray, radio, optical, and infrared waves. It turned out that people had finally seen a newborn magnetar for the first time ever. It was likely formed after two neutron stars had merged. It resulted in a kilonova, one of the brightest and largest stellar blasts. Its light finally reached our planet on May 22, 2020. Imagine a massive star, at least five times the mass of our sun, reaching the end of its life. It might be because it's run out of its nuclear fuel. If it happens, the star starts to cool off. The pressure inside drops, and the gravity starts to squeeze inward. And then, more than a million times the mass of our planet collapses within 15 seconds. It happens so fast that an enormous shock wave causes the outer part of the star to blow up. It produces a blinding burst of light. 
this powerful blast is called a supernova. What's left behind is an incredibly dense core with a huge cloud of hot gas, called a nebula, expanding around it. If the star has been massive enough, more than 10 times the size of the sun, it's likely to turn into a black hole. If not, it turns into a neutron star. It's basically a giant nucleus, the central part of an atom. These stars are mostly made up of neutrons and are rarely larger than 20 miles across. For comparison, our sun is almost 865,000 miles across, which is 109 Earths put side by side. But don't let this relatively tiny size fool you. Any neutron star is at least one and a half times heavier than our sun and has an intense magnetic field. If you scooped just a teaspoon of this star's insides, this matter would weigh more than a billion tons. It's so dense that it makes neutron stars some of the most extreme objects people know about. The next stop is the black hole itself. When two neutron stars merge, they most often create a new, much heavier one. Within milliseconds or even less, this star collapses into a black hole. But the astronomers who examined the flash of light recorded in March think there might be another outcome. They're almost sure they saw something never observed before, the birth of a magnetar. That's a rare form of a neutron star with an ultra-strong magnetic field. It's 1,000 trillion times stronger than our planet's. This field is also so powerful, it heats the star's surface up to 18 million degrees Fahrenheit. To put it simply, magnetars are the most powerful magnets in the universe. Their magnetic fields can seriously mess with the neighborhood. Atoms, unlucky enough to get close to such a star, get stretched into pencil-thin lines. If you somehow found yourself several hundred miles away from a magnetar, it would end badly for you. The magnetic field would first disrupt your bioelectricity. It means that your nerve impulses wouldn't work anymore. Even your molecules would change under the influence of the star's field. In the end, you'd pretty much vanish. If a magnetar flew within 100,000 miles from our planet, it would wipe out all the data on every single credit card in the world. Hop on board! Hurry, we don't have much time! We're on a cosmic journey to find the biggest star in the universe. The first star we pass is our own sun. By far, not the biggest one out there, but it's still massive. You could fit one million Earths inside it. That means if you think of the sun like a basketball, Earth would be half the size of a pencil eraser. If we put all the planets on one side of a scale and the sun on the other, the planets wouldn't stand a chance. The Sun makes up 99.9% .9 of all the mass in the entire solar system. Mass is basically how much stuff or matter something is made from. And it's what you can thank for stars shining. You see, the more matter in a star, the thicker and hotter its core becomes. This starts a chain of chemical reactions. Hydrogen atoms get smashed into each other to form helium releasing an incredible amount of energy. That's the star's light and heat. So, bigger stars also equal brighter ones. But with all those reactions going on, this shortens a star's lifespan. When it starts to run out of fuel, the star will enter the giant phase. It'll expand and turn red. Which brings us back to the task at hand. The biggest star we'll find is likely to be on the edge of its life. Switching on our hyper-light engines, we soon arrive at the Lumen 16 system. Here, we'll find one of the smallest stars out there, a brown dwarf. Small here means about the size of Jupiter, but they're small for stars. Brown dwarfs are also called failed stars because they don't have enough mass for those chemical reactions. That means they're not as bright, but they're super dense. All the matter in them is packed together so tightly, they weigh 80 times more than Jupiter, even being the same size. Huh, and if you think that's something, just look at a white dwarf, even more tightly packed. This one here is Sirius B. It's also about the size of Jupiter, but it'd weigh as much as the Sun. It emits a dim white light. Once it runs out of gas, it'll turn red and cool down. Now let's fly closer to its giant neighbor, Sirius A. 
you easily see this star from Earth. No telescope needed. Twice heavier and more than one and a half times wider than our Sun, it's the brightest star in our night sky. Now we fly 550 light years away from Earth to the constellation Cassiopeia. Almost a hundred years ago, a cosmic explosion happened here. It expanded the atmosphere of the star Gamma Cassiopeia, and some gases were thrown into space. After that, it became the brightest star in the constellation. It's ten times wider than our Sun. On to the famous North Star. Funny enough, different stars have had this title over the years, and more will take it in the future. That's because Earth's pole star changes every 26,000 years. Imagine our planet like a spinning top. The northern pole will shift around in a little circle, pointing at different stars to the true north. The current one is a supergiant 37 times wider and 5 times heavier than our sun. It's easy to find in the night sky. It's on the very tip of the Little Dipper's handle. Get ready now! We're setting off for the eye of the storm, the center of our Milky Way galaxy. To see the next star, we need to switch to infrared mode. This pistol star is hiding from us in space dust. In just 20 seconds, it emits as much light as our home star does in an entire year. And its size is jaw-dropping. It's 420 times wider than the sun. But it's still not the most luminous star known to humanity. That would be a blue supergiant in the constellation Triangulum. Meet B416. It's almost 10 million times brighter than the Sun. But the brighter a star, the faster it burns up all its fuel and the shorter its life. Compared with a red dwarf that barely glows and burns fuel much more slowly, its life will be hundreds of thousands of times shorter. 3,400 light years from Earth, there's one of the rarest celestial bodies in the universe. It's a yellow hypergiant called Rho Cassiopeia. Among the countless stars in our galaxy, there are only a couple dozen of these. And even though this star is extremely far away from our planet, you can still see it in the sky without needing a telescope. That's because it's 300,000 times brighter than our sun. It also helps that the thing is 900 times wider than our home star, too. And its color tells us that its fuel reserves will last for a long time. When Rho Cassiopeia starts to turn red and expand, it'll be one of the biggest stars in the entire universe. Now, we move to the constellation Orion. The star is in our sights. Betelgeuse, one of the largest ones visible to the unaided eye. 700 times the size of our sun, if it took our star's place, its surface would touch the asteroid belt. That's between the orbits of Jupiter and Mars. It would engulf the four inner planets, Earth included. But this star has astronomers very excited. They predict Betelgeuse will explode in a fantastic celestial show in the next 10,000 years. It'll be the greatest astronomical event of all time because we'll be able to observe a supernova at a close but safe enough distance. The exploding star will shine as bright as a half moon. It'll be visible in the daytime sky for a year and at night for several more. Now we venture to stars that exceed the sun's width 1,000 times. Mu Cephei is a hypergiant boasting the title of the reddest known star. Its color tells us that the fuel gauge is getting closer and closer to empty. But it's still so big that it could hold a billion suns in it. And because of its mass, this star will eventually become a supernova or even a black hole. Let's take a trip of almost 4,000 light years from home. Here it is, a red supergiant called V.Y. Canis Majoris. It's one of the biggest and brightest stars of the Milky Way. It could fit 3 billion suns. And even though it's so huge, this thing is surprisingly light, only 17 weights of the sun. In the context of celestial bodies, you could call this star an inflated balloon. In the next 100,000 years, V.Y. Canis Majoris will explode in a hypernova. Gamma radiation will destroy all life in the local part of the universe. But this star is so far from our solar system that it wouldn't mean any harm to us. If we placed M.Y. Cephei in the center of our solar system, it would bulge all the way out to Saturn's orbit. To remind you just how far away Saturn is, think of it this way. It takes the sun's light eight minutes to reach Earth. 
To get to Saturn, it takes well over an hour. Compared to this massive star, the Sun is just a grain of sand. It's one of the most luminous and reddest stars in our universe. The bigger and redder the star, the closer it is to its end. So, we're not looking at just a titan of the universe, but also one of the oldest celestial bodies out there. The second biggest star in the universe is UI Scuti. It's about 1.5 billion miles wide, 16 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. This is a pulsating variable star. Its brightness changes about every two years. UI Scuti is a record breaker in fuel combustion per year. Scientists expect it to evolve back to hotter temperatures like a yellow giant. Our journey is coming to an end. Before us, we behold Stevenson 218. It takes 20,000 years for light from this star to reach Earth. It's hard not to see this red supergiant on our tiny terrestrial home. It's 2,150 times wider than our sun. We'd need 10 billion suns to fill its volume. For comparison, the average beach contains only about 5 billion grains of sand.